Wonderful, and welcome to all of you to um, this webinar of the Humanities Research Fellowship for the Study of the uh, Arab World. We're very, very happy to have uh, William Zimmerle uh, with us today, um, a research fellow uh, and a dear colleague from uh, the Arts and Humanities. William was actually uh, a research fellow also already in 2018-19, uh, uh, so it's wonderful. He joined NYUAD afterwards, and now we're very, very happy to welcome him back again to the fellowship program this semester. So this is a great uh, deal for us to have him uh, present today about something that he has been extensively doing research on, but also carried into the classroom in varieties of ways. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity for us to talk a little bit more about his topic, Arabian Aromatics in the Cradle of Olfactory Perception. Um, and we have our dear colleagues, Robert Patesius and Ali Yunus, um, moderating and working behind the scenes uh, in the Q&A to facilitate this conversation. Um, I'll say one last thing before we get started. You'll find all the events um, of the fellowship program on our website and in our fantastically curated uh, newsletter, as well as on our Facebook page moving forward. The next event um, is part of the Recognizing Religion series on February 22nd, a panel discussion uh, with colleagues from Michigan and uh, Tel Aviv. Uh, but more on that later and in our uh, regular newsletter. So thanks so much, Alia, Robert, and above all, William, for joining us today. And I very much hope that you all enjoy this wonderful conversation. And over to Robert now to introduce William. Thank you, Martin. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's indeed an honor, not only that we have William uh, still in our ranks, because uh, he brings a lot to the table. But it's also an honor to actually introduce uh, William uh, and his speech, uh, his, his, uh, uh, his talk about um, actually what we, uh, what you consider actually to be a very uh, material. So if, you, if you think about uh, essence burners, you, you think about those things that you might hate because they smell so, you know, so strong, or you love them because you like the smell so much. Um, and uh, the first time I, uh, I actually met William was a few years back when I was also sharing a meeting of a conference of archaeologists. And I, I don't know how to say, but I always have that kind of sessions of, uh, of all kinds. So I, I, if I re recall uh, properly, there were underwater archaeological sessions. There were people excavating whole cities. And there was William with his essence burners. And I thought, yeah, essence burners, interesting. And I had actually no other thoughts than uh, those, those objects. And then I was so surprised how the, um, the presentation that he gave was not only an archeological material culture presentation, but he brought it really, really alive um, with the traditions that were attached to it, the questions that he had. So to my mind being from an archeologist more and more an, an, an heritage scholar, uh, that combination of intangible and tangible became so, uh, so, so lively for me. And I think you know, in the time that I know him also now at NYU, he added another layer of intangible and that's the scan to it. And so I'm really looking forward to, to hear his talk, uh, just to give him a little bit more background uh, where, where he comes from. Apart from also the courses that he gives, I know that a lot of students are very, very impressed by uh, uh, you know, his courses, they're very popular. Um, apart from making, that's uh, how they call it in, uh, in the, amongst the students. Um, but you know, he, he, his interest in this topic is, is much longer and his interest in, in the region. He, uh, he has a firm uh, education, uh, his PhD is from uh, in near Arabian, uh, near, near an Arabian archaeology. I'm going to read this out, I'm very bad in, in make sure that I have the, all the universities right, but from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he did a master's uh, in biblical studies from Harvard, postgraduate training in intellectual property and law from the University of Edinburgh School of Law. So you see that he has a very firm interest in the diversity, not only in archaeology, but also other aspects of, of heritage and, um, uh, and, and cultural connections. I, I got to know him actually in Oman, where we were at a conference uh, where he was teaching uh, uh, at the local university, uh, very enthusiastic for the local context. And I, I think the locals were also very, very uh, happy with him because he got several fellowships. You can, you can read them all in his bio. But what is important to mention is that he is the, the, the project director, especially also the founder of the Dovar Ethnography Project 
documenting the ins and burners of Frankenstein traditions in the Sultan of Oman. And I, I think apart from other advisory roles he had at prestigious universities, I think that link with Oman is uh, primarily what we're going to, to hear tonight, also the, the wider environment. Um, again, I hope that I transfer my enthusiasm to have him uh, at NYU Abu Dhabi, where we're trying to shape heritage studies since a few years. And he is a very important asset to, especially that link between the, the tangible heritage and the intangible heritage. If I forgot something still, William, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to promote yourself. Uh, I know you're very enthusiastic, so uh, I don't think I need much more introduction than that. Over to you, William. Great, perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that kind introduction. And um, I appreciate it. And thank you to Martin too um, for hosting this uh, forum today uh, for the invitation and um, to everyone at the Humanities Research Fellowship, uh, Reindart, uh, Alex, Manal, Raya, uh, uh, Alia for um, hosting with Robert um, this event. Uh, thank you so much, um, and I appreciate it. And uh, so let me just share my screen with you. There we go. And everyone can see that, correct? Perfect. Yes. Uh, so, perfect. perfect. So, um, so I think the big takeaway to start off with is if you can see anything that I've done is I've sort of tried to replace our torch with an incense burner. So if uh, if there's anything you can take away from this talk today, I think that's it. The 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 pride of place of incense burning and the incense burner itself in Arabian culture. And uh, if you don't remember anything else I talk about, I think that's really the key takeaway today that I want to stress that incense. Am I the only one that has a frozen image? I think we might be experiencing some technical difficulties here. So bear with us um, while we're sorting them out. I think we might have just lost William here. Um, let's see. Yeah, the internet is more and more challenging nowadays. I, I was restarting my computer for the for the same reason. Um, but to the audience, um, one of the interesting things about uh, his topic is that something so uh, so um, you know household as an instant burner, but especially if you from the culture here. Um, there are so many layers of knowledge that you can get out of the uh, archaeological evidence also the traditions of the use of those uh, burners. And uh, the, um, the skent is a layer that uh, is was, well, not that known. And thanks to, and he will explain it all, but I, I think I maybe give some background while we were waiting. Uh, but thanks to the, um, the science department here at uh, NYU Abu Dhabi, we have a lot of links nowadays with uh, uh, heritage questions that we have uh, about conservation of heritage, but also this type of, uh, of, of questions about if we have the ingredients, if we have the res residue of, of smell, can we really reconstruct the smell? And I, I think that is the, one of the most exciting things that, that came out of this uh, research. And it also opens up then questions about uh, how important is smell in our, uh, our value of culture. And um, one of the things that, that I experienced during the lockdown you know, we, we didn't travel. I spent most of my time here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and then people say, oh, you know, I, 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 I'm so nostalgic about traveling. And, you know, and, if, and at a certain moment, a friend to me said, well, you know, it, it really makes me sick. And I said, well, why don't we just, you know, dig up some photographs? And although it's nostalgic, why don't we just go and travel uh, to the places that we would like to travel to and we only have the photographs? And one of the interesting things that happened with me when I tried to relive going to a place, um, I smelled. Ah, there's William. 
<laughs> William, we were just basically singing your praises about the research and especially Robert was saying how wonderful it is that your research has um, connected not only the uh, folks working in a variety of areas in arts and humanities, but also the sciences. And I'm, I'm particularly curious, I'm not going to give any way anything else, uh, how you are working with the colleagues in science to essentially um, work with the residues to date and also talk about the composition, you know, of the various productions of um, the incense burners and how we can then geographically um, also position them. But but back to you, you're, you're all, it's all yours now. Let, let's try again. Yeah, we sorry about that. We didn't give anything away. No, <laughs> no, 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 no secrets. Right. Didn't give the secret away. So <laughs> I apologize for that. That never happens in my location. So I don't know. I don't know. Let's give it another go. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so back to this. Uh, anyone living in the Arabian Peninsula, of course, the idea of an incense burner likely doesn't need an explanation as it's an iconic symbol of heritage today. Um, and understanding the evolution of this form as a cultural continuity throughout the last two millennium, and really over the course of roughly 4,000 years of its evolved history, how it's transmitted from the past into the present day has not been well understood um, until the present. Uh, and that's roughly uh, what I would like to try to look at today in this presentation is a, uh, what I would say an anatomy of an incense burner uh, uh, from newly documented ethnographic material that uh, I've been working with since 2011, um, been curating. And I hope that that should expand our understanding of knowledge and clarify the relationship between burner users and burner makers uh, as we see a multivariate number of different uh, of meaning behind the this artifact type itself, where it's often used at liminal spaces. And doing so, I hope to sort of disentangle then uh, the object from some of our own presuppositions. This is often called a Frankincense burner uh, in the Sultanate of Oman. Um, William, yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but can you, uh, you share your screen again? Because we don't see your, uh, uh, your slides. Got it. Got it? Yep. Yes, we can see. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Uh, this is often called the uh, a Frankincense burner in certain parts of the Arabian Peninsula, um, in the Sultan of, of Amman, um, in Luban, Luban frankincense being the milky white, highly viscous aromatic gum resin that's cut from the tree of the Boswellia sacra. Yemen, the Hadramount, and then across into East Africa, and then across into uh, on the island of Socotra in the Indian Ocean. We're different species. There's roughly 25 species, types of species of this tree. And so what I hope to do is disentangle, uh, so to speak, the object from the aromatics, and then rebuild again in the process over the course of the next 30 minutes. Um, as we have gathered new scientific data and trying to understand uh, microscopically on the micro level what's going on deep within the basin of something like an incense burner. In terms of the history of the object itself, it really begins in the Western world for us in the 1890s um, when the first archaeological excavation conducted in Iraq, conducted by the Americans at the site of Nippur, um, led by John Punnett. P Peters uh, found forms such as this, uh, unusual terracotta forms, the photograph on page 186 of his Nippur explorations and adventures on the Euphrates River uh, clearly give us an indication of a type of form found from a mortuary context. Uh, these were identified um, by Hil uh, Herman Hilprick, um, the curator at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Museum at the time, who was working from Istanbul. I uh, identified them as just four-legged troughs. Uh, the uh, right side of the screen gives you the actual object itself. I was able to unite it with the object from the Istanbul Museum. And um, because many of those objects in that museum have not actually been handled for a long time, they've been in their cases, it still has preserved the very terracotta glazes that we get from Nippur. And uh, well, what you can see is that a lot of these artifacts in the past were highly colorful, very colorful, very glazed artifacts themselves. When they discovered these, they dated them to the Kassite period, roughly 1595, 1200 BC or so, found on the mound. Um, and um, more recently, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, We've I've changed some of the dating of those by redoing the stratigraphy. Uh, a few decades later, the British Museum, um, under a 
the excavations of uh, Sir Leonard Woolley excavated a number more, a large number of these types of objects. Uh, and you can see they kind of sort of struggled in the notes to define them and give them a definition. Uh, they were identified as a clay stand at first in the 1920s, then a clay model stool, um, and then a clay casket. Uh, and then eventually um, by the 1930s and indefinitely in his 1960s report, they were identified as fragments of incense burners. Uh, the key point in Woolley's analysis from Orr, the site in Southern Mesopotamia was that they suddenly come out almost out of nowhere. You see them in larger numbers uh, in the Babylonian, Neo-Babylonian period, the sixth century. And so he said a new ritual had been introduced a domestic ritual, and these were mostly found in contexts that were domestic, uh, sometimes mortuary. It's difficult to see the difference often. Uh, sometimes houses were uh, mortuary, uh, burials were beneath the houses, but, but generally you could see that a new ritual had emerged. Uh, in the night. Again, uh, again, what the Chicago team identified as knobbly wear, uh, this type of very unusual object, uh, cuboid in shape with a fenestrated top and a sort of barbatine, barbatine nobular um, clay um, fashion to it. And this was then, uh, because of the good stratigraphy and the sound excavations, we could actually put these out of the case, move these out of the calcite period into roughly about 900 BC to 700 BC. So uh, we were able to, I was able to actually in my dissertation, uh, work with the stratigraphy and get these uh, into a better uh, system for dating their um, contacts and their proveniences. And uh, they're from a mortuary context, so a very specific style, regional style that's in Southern Iraq. Uh, but then it wasn't until the 1990s that we really began to understand these forms, and that was uh, because of Arabian archaeology. In the 1990s, um, the um, excavations by um, the late uh, Maurizio Cl uh, Tozzi and Serge Clazou at Ras el Jins II, the site RJ2 on the coast of uh, south uh, eastern of the southeastern Arabian Peninsula in Oman, uncovered uh, basically one whole fragment and one whole vessel of an incense burner and two fragments um, in a domestic context. This one was the main one. The whole vessel was found upside down in the corner of a domestic building. Uh, its center was highly visible. Uh, there was a, a, a significant um, visible remain of crusted burnt residue, and it was approximately 12 centimeters. The artifact, uh, given a, an approximate date, these excavators of about 2200 BC or so. Um, and it was found sealed by a thick layer of bricks and clay components, according to their excavation report. The excavators of the site identified the object as a, a standard household, piece of standard household equipment. Um, but they weren't quite sure of what it was until, and here's the twist to the story, their workmen from Oman recognized the artifact as a al um, the in word for incense burner coming from the root gemmer for fire, uh, fire coal. And uh, they based their evaluation on the attribution of the form. The shape is well attested then therefore in Arabia and probably the most functional means for burning gum resins or aromatics for a lot of different reasons. One is it's easier to clean because of the widespread um, uh, wider surface area of these types of incense burners. Uh, and it's also wide enough to move around, sense oneself's body, one's clothes and the room and everything in the room across a wide space. When the local Omani workmen at Ras El Jins identified it as a majmara, mabhara, an incense burner, uh, they passed it to one another. Uh, simply making the traditional formal gestures that one does as recounted um, by the excavators in their report. Uh, and when they did that, they had gone through the process of, of, of attributing um, the identity of the form, right? How do we know an incense burner is an incense burner? Well, if you look enough at, at these objects, these artifacts, there are some key giveaways. One is the burnt remains. The other is the four legs, right? And the basin itself. And so they went through a process of cognitively determining the, what the object itself was. Uh, much of my work then therefore um, over the last few years has been to understand uh, the widespread distribution of incense burners of that type. Cuboid, sometimes uh, we call them cuboid in scholarship. They are sometimes rectangular or square, um, but generally hold that shape 
uh, and they appear in large numbers in the first millennium BC. And so much of my work has been to try to catalog as many of, of these incense burners as possible um, and um, to develop a new typology to try to understand them, uh, particularly uh, when they appear in Southern Levant or in Southern Mesopotamia or Northern Levant, as you see here and throughout the Arabian Peninsula. So doing this sort of work through the lens of the Arabian Peninsula and the forms that we have down here. Uh, they appear in large numbers in the first millennium. We have them in the second millennium, but large numbers in the first millennium. And this is largely the result of the Arabian incense trade. By the fifth century, things are well underway. And we have inscriptions from the Neo-Assyrians that talk about um, the actual seizing of aromatics of all kinds, uh, the actual Riku Kalama in Akkadian, uh, she in Sumerian is the logogram, uh, the, the logogram for, for gum resin, likely. Uh, and uh, this term is a rather generic term, but we know that there were large numbers of different types of aromatics um, that were traded, that were taken as booty, that were in distribution by the middle of the first millennium BC, by the sixth and fifth century, and definitely by the fourth century. Um, we also, this makes a lot of sense if you are to look at something, since this is Valentine's Day, I added this, if you are to look at something like the Song of Songs, uh, particularly if we date this text, the biblical Song of Songs, um, to the later period, which is largely likely the case, um, fourth century uh, in terms of its composition and its writing it down. Um, we have actually in that particular text, the citation of these two twin gum resins, frankincense and myrrh. Um, Song of Songs 3.6 says, Who's the, who comes up from the desert like columns of smoke? and clouds of myrrh and frankincense of all the powders of the merchant. So clearly describing, describing the caravan, the camel dromedary caravans that would come through the different way stations and the, in the, in, uh, in the towns throughout the Arabian Peninsula into the Levant on the way to Gaza and then on the way into the Mediterranean markets. Or in this case, Song of Songs 4, where we actually have these twin, again, myrrh and literally all the different aromatic woods Lebanon, the word for frankincense is here. And we see um, Lebanon coming from the root, meaning milky white or the white substance, which is cut from the tree. Um, by doing this kind of work, what we really realized, I think, was that um, there were, uh, well, well, for one, there was a, a, a major trade route, um, which we knew about, that ran from the south of Southern Arabia up through the Arabian Peninsula into um, uh, southern, the Southern Levant on the way through the Negev and then to Gaza and then the Mediterranean markets. Um, this map is a little misleading in the sense that I want you to understand that these are trade relays instead of one trade route. So they are evolving, they were organic. Um, but the idea here was that aromatics and all other kinds of things too were traded along, the, along these routes passing through different stations and on the way they were actually taxed. Um, in route. And um, by the four, fifth or fourth century BC, uh, they're probably skirting around the Negev. Um, they're not passing through, but by the time we get to the Nabataeans, second century BC and later, they are passing right through um, the, the, the Negev on the way to Gaza. Um, what's interesting here, though, however, is when I did this sort of work of sorting and cataloging the forms, uh, published and unpublished ones, you can actually see this route before your eyes and the incense burners light it up. So if we could, if we, when we place them where they were found, you can see the different trade routes that were there. And in many respects, there are some similar forms, uh, decorations on the forms, engravings on the forms. The forms along this route were largely stone ones. Um, and we have, um, uh, for example, um, in the south of Southern Arabia, the words for likely Leban, uh, uh, Luban frankincense written on the incense burners themselves. And uh, there's one from the Levant, uh, Lakish, the side of Lakish, where the actual word frankincense, the frankincense burner of Eos, son of this messenger is inscribed on the object itself. So we have stone burners running along these trade relays um, and very much a shared decorative engraving, um, sort of uniting this route. Uh, and you can see some of this here. Um, these, these images are taken from the natural environment, um, what I would call caravan art. And so these objects are moving. We think they are likely locally made, um, but the idea of this form is moving from place to place. 
and um, along the way, they are inscribing their incense burners with images from where uh, these objects are passing through. There are so many limestone and chalk, it's almost like 99%. So when you see a terracotta or clay one there, you know it's likely coming from the other side, Mesopotamia. There are only about 1% along that route. Um, in the south of, of uh, the Southern Arabia, what we see then on these incense burners is largely the engravings in the inscriptions of aromatics of all kinds, roughly then 13 different types of aromatics. And this teaches us that basically uh, the route was bi-directional. Things were leaving the Arabian Peninsula, uh, aromatics, and aromatics from the Mediterranean and the, the north of the lot were coming down into the Arabian Peninsula. And so there were a shared uh, sort of bi-directional flow of goods, aromatic goods. When you look at these um, inscriptions, you usually get one on each side of the cube. And so these are sent notes. And we could look to per modern day perfumers to help us understand that. Uh, you have three or four notes form a chord. And so some of these are high notes, middle notes, and low notes, depending on the density and viscosity of the aromatics. Anything of a gum resin, for example, will be a heavy aromatic, right? Much more of a dense aromatic to the perfume. But these are objects that are used as perfumers um, to perfume the body or to perfume the room, for example. Um, and so in these incense burners of the Southern Southwestern, uh, Southwestern Arabian Peninsula are inscribed with aromatics often or with the actual name of the dedicator, uh, the inscriptional name of the person. And so um, from doing this work, we've been able to sort of understand better the kind of context that these burners are found. They're found in temples and tombs in Southern Arabia. And these are just some examples that you can see here. Uh, caravanserai on their way through the trade relays, houses and tombs in the Southern Levant. And then in domestic and mortuary context in Mesopotamia and from Southern Babylonia right up to the middle Euphrates. Uh, and this is the other side of the route that I would like to talk to you today. So the first side was the overland route, stone incense burners, hugging the, 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 the west side of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, what became very clear in cataloging these farms was a, another tradition running along the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula up through Babylonia and then up onward into the middle, middle Euphrates and upper Euphrates Valley. And this was largely a combination of a land and maritime trade relay system uh, with the Euphrates River being used as a way to move these, um, the move the aromatics up, up the river to those places, houses in the north that would have been procuring aromatics of all kinds. And we actually have a nice uh, medical text um, that uh, Brunke and Salaberger published in 2010. It's on the bottom of the screen in red, um, but that Bronze Age text talks about the oil of Magan, the oil of Oman, right, that was in distribution at the time. And so this um, other route, this earlier route of incense burner um, movement uh, was a clay tradition. 99%, 98% are clay forms. Uh, and these have uh, much more geometric patterns on them. And we can find some of these types of forms in the United Arab Emirates today. In this country, there are about nine of them that I've cataloged. There's likely more. Again, um, once you know what you're looking for, it's easier to spot these. So in terms of the attribution of their forms, you might need to look for the leg, right? Sometimes, as you can see, they are fragmented and uh, you don't have the full form, um, but they are likely from Iron Age 3, 2nd, 6th, 5th, 4th century, maybe in, into the 3rd at Malia, uh, centuries BC, and they have a geometric patterning to them, much like, very similar to the types um, of the Mesopotamian tradition, um, however, again, most of the decorative patternings that you find are very regionally based, very locally based on them. And this gives you some idea of the Mesopotamian tradition, for example, of these small, small cuboid or square incense burners, the geometric patterns coming from the built environment um, that the potters would have used around them, the mud brick houses. Uh, in this sense, these are architectural models right, for burning incense within the home itself. And so from all of this work, two major points emerged, um, and these have been published uh, in some articles I've produced already. Uh, and these two major points are really this. The first one I, I um, released when we did a conference here, uh, my colleague Alan Fromhertz, friend and colleague, uh, did a wonderful conference on the golf and world history, and I presented for the first time some of this material, and I was able to then really work out some of the details that the last line 
in that article for most of the instance burners from this tradition, the incised images were not from expected trading regions, but were images of the natural or local environments where the burners had been manufactured locally. And that was really the point there that became very apparent from doing this kind of cataloging and sorting. And then the other point that became very apparent that I've published elsewhere is that the idea of the form, this form is just as important as the traded artifact itself. That if these are locally made, then the form of the cuboid or square is embedded uh, as an incense burner into the minds of, of craft individuals, whether they are stone cutters or, 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 or potters crafting out of clay. And this background then becomes the, the big uh, starting point, I would say, for understanding uh, the second half of this presentation, uh, the ethnography. This presentation is in three parts, the historic material, the ethnography, and then some of the things we're doing with the scientific aromatics or the aromatic scientifically. So going back to this initial Russell Jin's form, um, we realized that um, the original excavators didn't know where the form was, what it was, they looked to their Armani workmen once again, and their Armani workmen pointed to the fact that these are actually um, incense burners that are used right to sense the home, to sense the body. Uh, and this is our starting point. Uh, after I had learned this and began to work uh, on this project uh, in 2011, I was funded by the Sultanate to go to Amman and to begin a project to try to understand incense burner production. Um, and we began the Dofar Ethnography, Ethnoarchaeology Project. Um, and that project has expanded from pottery to actually aromatics as well, we working in the southernmost region of Oman first on incense burner production in these, uh, the area of Dofar, where a unique type of incense burner, a square cuboid form, is still made today by hundreds and hundreds of potters. Uh, and you can see examples right here of that form. This area is unique because of its microclimate, its environmental features where again, Boswellia sacra or frankincense, the ban grows in abundance. And because of that growing, there is a specific type of incense burn being made and that's that square form. Um, we, I'm proud to say that we've actually worked in every area of the Sultanate now. Um, and the first, art, the first book has been released in Oman, future publications are coming. I'm working on them this semester. Um, but you can see here, uh, in the bottom left is what a traditional majmara um, in Dofar looks like, made of clay. Uh, we also worked then outside of Dofar for comparative purposes in Nizwa and Bala, and you can see that here. Um, the forms up there are rounded, in fact, and they're made by men. In fact, uh, they tried to make a square form at one point. They tried to show me, and it clearly wasn't anything like a Dofari form. So, and they were trying to make it for the tourism market. But in actuality, the square cuboid form is only made in Dofar um, or Yemen or on Socotra Island. And then we have worked also up in the Misendum Peninsula, right, working on incense burner production there. Um, and I'll show you a few pictures of, of some of these areas for comparative purposes. Um, but the bulk of the work we've done to try to understand this craft production, this idea of how incense burners in the past were made out of clay has been done in the Dofar region. And on the bottom of the screen, you see a wonderful potter, potter Mona, um, who was the first potter we interviewed and worked with in, the, in, um, in 2011. Um, she was in her late 70s then. Uh, a couple of years later, I had a student at Dofar who said, you got to meet, you have to meet my grandmother. Let's go up to the mountain. And we went up and, uh, and I walked in the room and a few years had gone by and she said, it's you. And I said, it's you. So um, there's a very um, rich and uh, um, sort of wonderful background to the, to the work we've done because it involves working with people. And so um, she passed away a few years ago um, then, but we were able to uh, document the work of her incense burner production making. Uh, and I would say that we actually caught the last group of potters in their 70s and 80s, especially in the early years of the project. Um, and I'm glad we did um, because we got some of the older forms that are very hard to find and to understand today and how they're made. Uh, we started with a series of questions and ethnographic questions on, on what are you doing? And that really didn't work so well. And I, I, I had to shift our understanding to a, from a what to a how. Uh, and that, that made the project very visual in its construction. Um, and then we began to take a lot of photographs 
and a lot of video. And so we have hundreds of hours of video of incense burner producti production here in Dofar. Um, we're actually able to document the processes that a young girl, um, uh, at, at, you know, at the age of six, how she gets involved in making incense burners because she learns it at home. Um, we have videos of where she um, is working alongside her mother and just picks up the steps um, just by rote. And so we've been actually um, been invited to people's home after years and years of working on this project uh, in order to do this sort of documentary work. Now for comparative purposes, um, just, just to take a look, um, this form is an inconvenient form, this square cuboid form. And that's the key in all this is that um, it's not a form that's easy to make. Uh, and if you look at other areas around the Arabian Peninsula, the Masenda Peninsula, for example, um, the process is very different. You know, we, as I said, we worked up in the village of Lima and we worked on these forms a bit. Um, and these are rounded forms made by women and men, those families who make them, for example. Or we've worked as well, expanded the project into East Africa now. And I did a bit of this work as a spring when I was on the Humanities Fellowship in spring 2018 um, and working in Ethiopia. And again, we, we largely get rounded forms, frankincense, loop, Storax or Lubanja, what they'll call, they'll actually burn in these forms themselves in what's called the gire or gigiri, uh, a different name for an incense burner. Um, this is a form that you can see being made here by one of the potters um, outside of the city of Harar that we began to work in one of the villages known for its incense burner production. Um, and the processes of making a, a incense burner like this, a rounded form is, is very different um, in many respects. And um, uh, even though at times frankincense and Luban will be burned in it. Um, so we wanted to do some comparative work to see how extensive this square form uh, really was um, to try to understand um, why it has lasted for so long um, in the archeological record and to the present day itself. And you can see here, um, just across the, the, the ocean, uh, well, what the incense burner production process looks like. And we were able to go back a few times to that village and also see the burnishing process. So the break down the steps, so to speak here um, from the actual forming, forming the clay, right? To the burnishing of the vessel itself on a different day. Um, so when you contrast that, those, that form with the form in Dofar, um, the processes are very different. It takes roughly about three years for a potter to, um, to really master the form, the square form, the cuboid form. Uh, and I've outlined in this earlier publication, Crafting Cuboid Incense Burners in the Land of Frankincense, published by Oman, I've outlined that process um, in roughly about 11 steps. Uh, and um, you can see the itemization of these different steps and uh, the incense burner being made and the different components. Uh, because again, these are architectural forms in Dofar as well. Uh, and the potters, when I've asked them, you know, where does the idea of the form come from? They, you know, you know they'll say they'll look to the old mud brick houses that were once there. Um, that's what they remember. And that the, the, the idea of the form is being passed from generation to generation. And the same thing is with the designs, the design patterning. Um, so what we have here, what forms an incense burner really for a dofari um, are the step crenellations and the horns. That is a key component of an incense burner. Um, for, for most of them. Uh, also the design perimeter, and then there's a central space that's in the middle where the potter will put the most important uh, decorative feature there, sometimes with register lines. So there could often be even somewhat of a narrative, a decorative narrative, and then some types of legs, a window and a base. Um, and so this itemizes that process. And you can see here, um, just breaking it up into steps, which archeologists love to do, kind of helps us understand the transition that have taken place in the construction of an incense burner like this. So we've broken it up to see. And every one of these steps we've actually have gone out and been part of, right? Right down to obtaining clay. So um, 
uh, so, um, and I've learned to make this form as myself as well at one point. So um, uh, we've done quite a bit of work to really immerse ourselves ethnographically into the process of what's involved in making a form like this and breaking it down into these patterns, um, into these steps allows us then to highlight the variations and the conceptions of the form. And to really begin to see the form as an invention and even an innovation within the different region, um, as you see here. Um, firing is now mostly done in kilns. Uh, it's no longer done um, out in the open, but cow dung and uh, palm wood was often used as the way to burn these vessels in the past. Uh, now, some innovative people have often made their own kilns as well, or hot boxes to do it, as you see here. But generally, that process is now um, kilns that are placed into associations where individuals can drop their pottery off and have it burned in, uh, in a kiln. And you can see the breakdown of how this looks. Um, the, the way a dofari makes an incense burner, for example, is to mold out slabs of clay uh, and to coil them. Uh, two real ways to do this. Uh, to, to, to mold two boxes or just to coil, um, depending on how one was trained. Um, but generally, the idea is that you create a box and then from there, architectural features are added on to the incense burner and cut, uh, cut out of clay. Uh, these begin with the horns uh, and then the crenellations and then the actual windowing of the base. And then the potters begin to work on the decorative fashion, the decorative fashion these geometric patterns. Uh, they'll often work from right to left or left to right, depending on if they're right-handed or left-handed, um, filling often the, um, the, the perimeter first or the upper or the lower registers first. Um, these kind of pattering dots and circles are very Arabian. They go back and um, these, these patterns are, are sort of embedded cognitively in the minds of the potters. And then they'll actually work on this central field of view or central area, um, what I call where you would put the most important sort of decoration you want to put on an incense burner. Um, and in this case, the potter is working from right to left, as you see there. And here you see another one, um, right, of just incising the clay um, with basic wooden tools um, that, that, they, that they have available to them. And we have sound as well. I haven't unmuted that sound because, um, well, for a lot of different reasons, but um, one of the things that the project has is also sort of projects within projects. And um, the, the dominant language in Dofar is Jabali or uh, Shafri language, a modern South Arabian language. And so uh, we've had to learn a bit of that. And, and in the process, document some of the, do some lexicography work, some of the stories and some of the prayers associated with an incense burner. And so this is just one of them that we caught um, from a woman in her eighties before she passed away. She actually, we were able to record this in a recording um, and uh, Yaluban, Yaluban, um, and that part's in Arabic. The rest is in actually Jabali. Um, and uh, it's literally, it's a, oh, frankincense, you who go to the heavens keep away from us, the enemy. And then there's something, another word in Jabali in there that we're not sure of, but then protect us from the hatred of the friend and enemy. So we've been able to actually do projects within projects um, to try to understand uh, not just the making of these burners, but actually the using them, right? Um, and uh, here's another one, for example, that's been published, may this carry away all of our problems, whether they are caused by human or by gin, by me or by strangers, whether jealousy by an enemy, by male or by female, lets us take away all the sickness and troubles from us and our belongings for those whom we love and from those whom are so sincere towards us. And so we've done some of this lexicography work to try to understand 
the, the meanings behind these. We, when we consider how old the form is in Dofar, um, I think the only evidence we have, we, the, the idea of an instance burner with a handle goes back to 15th or 16th century at the site of Shwarma in, uh, in Yemen. Um, but the only other evidence we have for that then is largely a photograph in the 1930s when Bertram Thomas made his way through Dofar. Um, and this is one of the most outstanding photographs you could find because there they talk about a cow not giving enough milk. Um, and basically the problem is, right, uh, maybe a bit of, bit of evil. And, uh, uh, and so uh, the, the, the remedy, right, to get the cow to give milk once again is actually lighting up an incense burner and saying a prayer. And so um, this is a, a fabulous piece of evidence that we've been able to include in my last publication um, that shows uh, some of the multivariate meanings and the multifunctions of an incense burner. Um, Bertram Thomas actually wrote, the mountain tribes are very much afraid of the evil eye, not only for themselves, but equally for their flocks and herds. The ceasing of lactation is invariably ascribed to Ein Blaus, the cure is frankincense. The incense burner was brought and wood introduced and lighted the practitioner, the cow owner, broke a fragment of frankincense about the size of a walnut into three pieces. Then spitting upon it three times, he introduced it into the burner while two other witnesses held the afflicted animal by head and leg, respectively, he waved about its head the burning frankincense, chanting a set sacrificial chant. And so we're lucky to have this photograph, one of the first um, of Dofar of its time. Similarly, also um, newly married couples in Dofar uh, will also sit before an incense burner, um, one that's burning a frankincense first to ward off evil, and then also to purify the home from evil irritants, and then second to fumigate the body. And this domestic ritual I think we can also see um, right back in the first millennium and all of those burners that we uh, kind of worked our way through in the first half of this presentation, when we look at someone like the historian Herodotus, who teaches us about the burning of incense and how they actually did it back then in the fifth century BC, what he wrote analogously in his histories. The last thing um, just to talk about in the next few minutes is some of the new work I'm doing this semester on this topic, and that's the role of being on the research fellowship. One thing is we'd like to understand better these aromatics of all kinds that were burned inside of the uh, incense burners. And so our starting point are these are the the lexic the, the lexicography work, the the inscriptional work that's on the incense burners in Old South Arabian. And we have about 13 different types of aromatics that are inscribed on them. You can see some of them here coming from different areas. Some of these are hard to understand because, uh, well, the terms are just descriptive in nature. They just describe the qualities of light, uh, of color, or of the qualities of scent. And that's often the way we think about scent. Um, we largely think about it in terms of its visual character categories. Um, so in order to understand better, we've actually been going to the field and collecting samples ourselves to understand what it means to put our noses inside an incense burner and to, uh, to fumigate ourselves. Um, students in my Making Sense of Arabian Sense course have done some of this work with me uh, a bit and when we went uh, last couple of years ago to the Louvre Museum, um, but we're actually collecting samples and running them through the experimental um, lab here in at NYU Abu Dhabi um, and coming up doing a PCA analysis of many of these different um, aromatics. And a PCA analysis means we actually collect the features, all 30,000 sometimes of these features are represented by a dot. But we collect the features of the aromatic itself. I've gone to the field as you see in the bottom, collecting these samples. And there's a lot of different components to this project. Um, we often have to deal with different languages, right? Uh, in East Africa, for example, um, you know, sometimes it was Somali, sometimes it was Amharic. Um, you know, there was sometimes a confusion, or at least confusion for me to understand which uh, um, which aromatic was was which aromatic. Um, you know, Lubanja uh, in Ethiopia wasn't Luban frankincense. Uh, church, they called it church, which was frankincense as we knew it. Um, but the way that we can understand a lot of this is by running it through the machines. And so um, we've been running it through the machines, and along the same lines, been running the residues of some old incense burners, ancient incense burners uh, through the machines. We've run 14 samples through um, and we have a few more coming that people have sent me and we've been running them through. At least two or three have yielded the properties of frankincense. So we are coming up with the frank properties of frankincense and a few incense burners from roughly the second half of the first millennia. So um, although we've taken a sort of the incense burner apart, we're sort of putting it back together. And it is indeed true that it looks like frankincense is burned in many of these cuboid shapes, 
But I want to be careful here to say that probably a lot of other things were burned in there as well. One thing you could see on the chart on the right is that myrrh is way off the, the chart, and that's because we did not find the properties of myrrh at all. So we've been able to cancel many things out, and that's one of them. These are clearly, if they are being used as frankincense, that's the frankincense trade. They're objects of frankincense, burning frankincense, and not objects of burning, burning myrrh. And I think that's an important point to make uh, today. I'd like to just wish my gratitude to many people who made all of this possible, particularly in Oman. Um, and uh, I welcome any discussion or questions that you have. And um, you can always reach me at NYU as well at my email address um, if you'd like to discuss some more. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, William. And apologies for the technical challenges. Uh, no so my apologies. <laughs> Yeah. No, yeah, yeah. We, we don't know what the internet is, but it is a little bit like the scant traveling over those trade routes. But what I find really, really fascinating is, is uh, you know, the, the very thorough uh, archaeological work that you do, uh, combined uh, with science now, but also the ethnographic, the, uh, arch the ethno-archaeological uh, side that you cover, the, the, you know, making the link basically between the present and the past, you know, you could very, you know, very long back in history, but also it is up till today that you're recording the people using that past. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's really fascinating. I, before I open uh, the, the, the other questions and I find out the technology here, but one question is uh, the, 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 the samples that you took, maybe I missed it, but are they also from other, from different parts on those trade routes? Because I'm, I'm very much interested in when you say that those designs are kind of universal, but also very regional and very local, uh, depending on the materials and depending in the in the examples that they have. I'm also wondering to what extent this the the flag fragrance itself, the scent, is is transnational or or can be very local. That is maybe something you can't yeah. answer, but maybe that's a an, an, an question that you have. Yeah, and it's a difficult question. Um, one of the things we've tried to do first. Um, because there wasn't a catalog for this material. So one of the things we've been doing first is just, collect, I've been collecting samples. Now that slowed down a bit because of COVID of course, but um, when things were up and running, collecting samples, bringing them back, running them through the machine and taking GPS coordinates of where the samples were taken from. So for example, different trees, different trees, different species of trees and different places of the trees in Oman, for example, and then in East Africa, so that we had very good um, data because this didn't exist really. Um, I mean, you can go and get samples from a botanical garden, but you don't know where the sample came from, right? Um, and so we were trying to really be a lot more systematic in the process of collecting um, the aromatic, um, the modern day aromatic samples uh, from, from, from flora uh, and really know where we were taking the samples from, right? And we've done that. So um, whether we can be as clear and precise um, well, you know, the sample that we found from, you know, that we've tested from Southern Mesopotamia looks like it's coming from Yemen, right, the frankincense. So, um, so we can be, we, we can see the difference of the species that, of frankincense in Yemen and in Dofar, for example. So, um, uh, and you could also see that if you just hold the two up, right, the Yemeni, if you hold up Yemeni frankincense and then Dofari frankincense, you could see the difference too. Um, and you could probably smell the difference too. Um, but the machine certainly picks up the difference as well, right, in the features. Yeah. So we can, we can, you know, once we get back up and running in the future, um, when travel is possible, we'll be doing more of that, right? And to, to build up that catalog so that we can do more sampling and testing. Um, but, but again, it's, it, it's been, the samples we've done have been um, legacy collections from museums, which means it's taken us a lot more work and time because of levels of contamination, but we're able to do it because the machines are very, very sensitive, right? Um, you know, the guys in the lab often will say the machine smells, right? So that's the, that's the, that's the thing they like to say, right? And it, and it really is true. The, machine, the machines can, can, pick up, can pick up quite a bit um, compared to, compared to um, most, most machines, right? So, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm also curious to, you know, if you go further in that ethnographic and that ethnoarchaeology, you know, com having the material culture together with, with how it's interpreted, where, where the people are going to talk more about frequency and maybe you can even you know uh, have um have tests with with the smell that you that the local people uh mm -hmm. from other region uh, can comment on it. it it's a very very interesting uh, topic i'm i i have to um i have alia yunus also invited to the discussion because within the uh, the decra center for heritage studies 
uh, as I said, you have the, the tangible side and the intangible side. And Alia is a dear colleague who does a lot in the memory studies and the intangible side. So um, also the technology of reading the questions. I, I would like to introduce Alia and, and ask her uh, whether there is a question that she got from the audience that she can summarize or post to, to William. Uh, hi, everybody. Yes, there's a question here from May. Thanks for a really interesting presentation. What is the effect of movement on the shape of the Mubakra? Um, do demand side preferences influence the supply side manufacturing? Uh, so for the modern day, yeah. So we've been tracking since 2011. Um, so, the do <laughs> so, so, so the dominant form right now, the demand for a form among locals in Dofar is usually not a square form. It's usually a form that's um, outside of the box, so to speak. It's a high heel. It's a, um, a modern day glittery form, something that, um, and usually for someone's wedding, right? So, and that's the, that usually is what's in demand for a local these days. Um, uh, whereas it's still the traditional form. I think what happens is a lot of tourists come uh, and we had to do a lot of work here. Uh, you know, I had to move outside of Salala because Salala was a center for tourism. So I had to move outside of the tourism area to start a, to, to begin to see other things um, because otherwise it's the tourist market that's dominating the, the, the craft production. But what happens is a lot of tourists arrive and I think they want a square form because they're told that's the form, which it is. There's two forms. There's the square form and there's the rounded form. The square form um, is generally the oldest and that's what most older locals will tell me. Um, although the rounded form is old itself too, right? Um, uh, you know, there's some tension there. Um, but the, the, the dominant form generally among locals is something that looks a, a lot different. Now, potters are often pushed to the challenge. And uh, you know, when we interviewed a lot of them, for example, um, older women will take the risks as a potter to make something outside of that square form. Um, younger women, not always, because they're just starting their career as a potter. Don't forget, there's about 400 potters now or more. This has exploded as a craft, um, partly because um, it's become a heritage craft in, in and of itself and it's being supported, right? Um, and, uh, and I'm glad to say too, that we've got that last wave of potters in the 19, uh, in the 2011, 2012, those older ones that were making very, very traditional forms. We were able to document that most of them have unfortunately passed away. Um, and so we can't do that documentation anymore. Um, but um, we are seeing the we are seeing the changes in the craft production over the last decade now. Um, and uh, you know that's an, another bit of work I'd like to do because we have these older videos and so forth where we could do the comparisons, right? Um, uh, and then we have some older photographs from the 1980s, 90s. Not much though, right? To try to make some more comparisons. But it's you know no one's really done this documentation work prior to, we to when we started in 2011. Thanks. I can see there's time for like, for one more question and it's from Eli. Thanks for this really interesting talk. In your archeological examples, is there any indication that the different materials the burners are made from affect the burning process? Yeah. I, the yeah. sandstone yeah. examples encourages longer burning and different frankincense experiences. Yeah, that's a really, yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, and we never, you know, we never, <laughs> it would be hard to, tr I, I'm not sure, right? And that's a really good question. Um, clay, <laughs> you know, stone actually is preserved much longer by very nature, right? Clay, you know, and the, and the differences here seem to be have what, what they have at their disposal. You know, Mesopotamia, you know, you can make anything, you make everything out of clay, right? So, because um, of the alluvial plain and, and in the Levant, you have a lot of chalk stone in the Southern Levant. So um, the, the clay gets destroyed pretty quickly. And we've done some tests, ethnoarchaeology tests to see that, at least with Dofari clay, because Dofari clay has a problem. Uh, even when they make something, they have to put sesame seed over it to hold it together because the clay is not a very, it's a very porous clay and um, uh, there's not a lot of inclusions in it. And um, so, um, so we know that the stone vessels seem, seem to, to be preserved a little better, maybe. I, you know, it's a hard question to answer. Um, the fact is so many of them are broken too when, we've, when we have found them archeologically. Um, and this is why uh, you know, I was able to catalog a lot more because I know when I was looking, knew what I was looking for, lakes and so forth, and um, I, I knew that's what, a, that it's an incense burner where others were having trouble identifying it. So I'm not entirely sure. It's a good question to keep thinking about. I know the clay, 
definitely clay. We've tried with um, the clay in Bahla and the clay in Dofar. The clay in Bahla actually, that's also been very difficult to work with. And many times the burner will just break. It'll crack on us, right? Um, when we heat it, when we heat it up. Um, but I think the idea in Dofar is that these things are so disposable and they break, they break and you just get another one, right? Um, where in the archeological record, it probably, you know, how easy it is to get another one. Um, you know, again, they're locally made. Um, but that's something I don't have a full answer for, um, but something we've been thinking about as well. So thank you for that question. Thank you, William. I, I hear that we can go a little bit over time. And I, okay. Alia, you, you were kind of the messenger, but uh, from, from your perspective of uh, um, these kind of identity uh, issues that are linked with the, you know, the status of having this kind of object, but also the the intangible heritage like Skent and the flagrants uh, attest to. Do you have still an observation or an, uh, a question that you would like to share? Um, I do, and I want to make sure I put in one small question from Eli also. Um, mm -hmm. He'd like to know, what's the date of the Akkadian text reference to frankincense from Megan? I think it's a Bronze Age, right? So um, it's in, it's you eat, but the exact date I'm not sure of. Right, um, it may be a little bit after, it may be about 2100 BC, but I'd have to double check, right? It's UET, uh, it's Brunke and Salaberger 2010. So, so, and it's in German, I believe, the article. So, and I could dig it up. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I also wanna follow up a bit related to May's question. Um, I was wondering if this was a sustainable way of making a living for the potters, which mm. I think you've answered with government support it is. But yeah. would the, would, why, maybe this is the wrong time to ask it, but why did this, is, is it so popular still within Oman and the Gulf in general, but it faded yeah. out, you kept referring to the Levant and, and its connection to the Levant and why is, why, why did it kind of disappear as a, as a, as a part of the culture there? Um, yeah, you know, and um, that's a good question. I don't think we know. I think uh, the form, when, when you get into the medieval form, um, the medieval period uh, and later, um, you know, the 15th century, uh, um, 16th century Islamic periods, you have beautiful um, bronze, uh, bronze forms and zoomorphic forms and the quartz and wonderful forms that are probably better for burning non-gum resins. Gum resins get sticky, so they'll stick in an incense burner and they're hard to remove and they're terrible to clean up. Um, so, um, so I think what happens is because I think it's tied, I think this is very much tied to the frankincense trade and the using of frankincense. And uh, after after the Byzantine period and so forth, frankincense is not used as much. It just isn't. And so um, I think that may be largely the connection uh, here. Um, we, we find it, you can literally draw a circle today, Dofar, Hadramaut, and then Socotra Island, right? And where the trees are growing. So um, I think a lot has to do probably with this connection with frankincense. I'm still teasing that out, I think, right? Still trying to understand that. Um, and uh, certainly uh, in the Levant, other forms take over, you know, in the Christian period, you have uh, all sorts of forms that are um, swung, swung back and forth, right? Um, and uh, in the Islamic period, Umayyad, we have a few of the square forms with handles. Um, uh, and we can even track when the handle appears, for example, and then they appear through those Umayyad periods. Um, but then there's an introduction of all sorts of other forms as well. And uh, I think a lot of this has to do with the types of resins you're burning in them. So a gum resin, a sticky, vis highly viscous gum resin is going to need an open basin generally for cleanup, right? And uh, other, gum, other resins, aromatics, largely use other types of vessels. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alia, also for helping with uh, the questions and uh, giving that other dimension. Uh, William, this was, for me, it's, again, it's, it was a very interesting uh, talk with so many layers. And I really hope that uh, we can keep you <laughs> in the region, you know, here, uh, and also see if we can uh, do some more work also in the UAE on, uh, on mapping and on, uh, on finding more. Uh, and and yeah, the richness of the science department is just to be discovered by the people from the humanity. So, Thank yeah. you so much. Um, I hope that the recording will uh, will also reach a lot of other audiences. And uh, thank you for uh, for your contribution.
Oh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. And of course, thank you for all the people that listened and, and posted questions. You know, it's it's a very challenging time because I'm only looking to William now, but I know that there are, I think, something like 30 or 40 people behind this uh, listening. So I don't see you and then I uh, forget to thank you for your attention. But uh, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for everyone who attended.